British Columbia is under a state of emergency as wildfires continue to grow. And temperatures are busting records on a regular basis. Escaping the flames with moments to spare. Dramatic scenes from Lytton, British Columbia earlier this week. Physically stressed by the drought that's hitting much of the West. The southern interior and the southeast are seeing the highest level of drought in years. The blue sky over Merritt, B.C. has been obscured by shades of red and black. The flames and smoke of a monster fire more than 60,000 hectares in size and growing is now threatening the city. A minute by minute, hundreds of thousands of dollars could be just evaporating into the sky. On the, on the dry riverbed, you've got hundreds of little fish dead. Scientists have little doubt climate change is playing a role. Why are the fish not coming back? The naysayers say that you will not turn this problem around. You're wasting money building these fish habitat structures. Your habitat restoration is not worth the trouble. It's all coming to fruition. The, the flooding, the fires. We don't have steelhead in the upper North Thompson anymore. Why is it not producing many, many fish? The way that the environment is reacting to this and, and streams are reacting. Climate change is a huge thing. It's going to negatively affect salmon populations in the province. The blue bridges out there were engineered way beyond our standards to the standard of public safety. Impacts of people and expansion and use of other resources that do impact you know, salmon. We accelerate the impact to these remaining fish stocks if we can't make some kind of adjustment in our behavior. This generation of kids that we're in now may never experience traditional fishing. Only if we look at all of the habitat needs of salmon throughout all of the province are we going to find a solution that works for everybody. You know, the creation story talks about how um, when the creator is making man, he gave, the salmon gave their voice. So that's why I always see the salmon going like that. Well, there are all kinds of charts showing declining fish population abundance, and they're very graphic. Uh, and this has been going on for decades and decades. The loss of fish populations is related to a number of things. One key factor, only one of the key factors, is declining natal stream habitat. Natal stream are basically the nursery grounds for Pacific salmon in the interior of BC. And there are many, many streams with many small rivulets that collectively add up to a huge amount of habitat. And though there may only be a few hundred fish in each small stream, they add up to the large coastal runs that the commercial fishing industry relies on to harvest from. So the interior produces a lot of fish to the coast. Of course, not all of them, but there's a lot of value in the interior streams in terms of fish that are produced down to the coast. Uh, there are other factors as well. So not to say natal stream habitat is the only issue, but it's definitely a big one. If there's no quality remaining in the natal stream habitat and the egg to fry survival rates are low amongst the few fish that do get back here, it's a guaranteed outcome that these fish populations are not going to recover well. So I think one of the really outstanding things is we've known that fish population declines are going on for a long, long time. It's not a secret. We've been working to try and undo some of the impacts of uh, you know, human-related development that has sort of contributed to the declining quality of these fish habitats scattered throughout these interior streams. But now, more than anything else, you don't need to see any numbers, just look at the news. Here are symptoms that are undeniable of climate change impacting stream runoff events. We just had a rain-on-snow event that we always worry about in the spring, in the fall. That's a new one. who are losing their homes, losing everything that they know and love. Uh, it's just crazy. It blew bridges out that were engineered way beyond our standards to the standard of public safety, which is built to a much higher standard than fish habitat is usually built to. And even those structures didn't stand a chance. They blew out overnight. Both routes north on the Coquihalla and west on Highway 7 completely blocked. Some people have been hoarding goods and supplies. So we've got a lot of symptoms showing up of climate change that are exacerbating the problem we already had with declining salmon stocks. And it's going to really accelerate the impact to these remaining fish stocks if we can't make some kind of 
adjustment in our behavior to help mitigate those climate change impacts. I used to be part of what was called the Barrier, uh, Barrier Watershed Group, and that was a group that we formed with local people in Barrier. Seepk uh, was part of it, and we did the same thing for Lewis Creek and looking at how we can protect the habitat and how we can work together on different things. And some of those older members of those group, I think they're, they're all gone now, but they talked about how there used to be steelhead in the Barrier River and they used to enjoy catching them. But that has changed as well. We don't have any more steelhead. I was just looking at records um, last month for temperature. Every year in BC that we've had a really big spike in temperature, We've had issues at the hatchery with bacterial kidney disease. And to me, I think that's related to that temperature because every year that we had that spike, we had a real big, you know, like this past fall, we had a high BKD at our hatchery and last year was record temperatures in BC. So it has an impact on the salmon because anything over 19, water over 19 degrees will impact salmon. And, you know, just all of that, um, that growth that can be there, that, you know, the bacterial kidney disease that we faced in our smolts last year, we lost probably 50, we did lose 51% of our, our fry when we ponded them because that's when things started warming up was last spring. And uh, it has a huge impact. For an example, this past year, um, we didn't have, we had very low returns, if any, salmon coming back to the North Thompson watershed that affected the bears. Eagles probably had to find something else to eat, but we noticed bears were a huge problem in our community. We had to actually dispatch three bears in our subdivision, one of our subdivisions this past, this past fall, because they were coming in hungry. The berries that were there were eaten up by the bears that you know were innovative and got out there early. So there wasn't a whole lot left after, after the berries had gone because, and even you know some of our membership found that the berry crops weren't there because it was so hot this summer. They, they just didn't grow. Um, so just looking at how no salmon affected the bears and just the whole reaction along along the line. The way that the environment is reacting to this and, and streams are reacting, I think it was pretty evident that we were going down this this trail, right? And you know, the heat has been going up, this, the water temperatures. I remember I did a project, I'm not even sure how many years ago, and it was that real, when the water, you, you know, there was such a loss of water. And so there was a huge issue about, you know, working with farmers and landowners about getting more water for these streams to keep these salmon alive. So it's, it's, it's been there and it's coming around now. Probably the tough one. <laughs> it's, uh, you know, you quite often hear of cumulative impacts. And, and I think in the world of salmon, that is truly the case. We, we cannot point the finger at one particular, um, you know, problem and or, you know, even group of people, uh, users, uh, or, or the, you know, the habitat itself. I, I think salmon have a, uh, a long life history of, uh, you know, a component of it is living in fresh water as a juvenile uh, for a minimum of a year, uh, and then going, you know, to the ocean and rearing and, and, and living in the ocean for a number of years, and then returning back, um, you know, through a bunch of, um, you know, fisheries and or just natural predation back to their spawning ground. So within that entire, you know, life cycle and, and route that these fish take, there, there's issues and problems at every stage. Um, and natural predation obviously is one component, of it, but I think, you know, in more modern times we have impacts of people and expansion and, and use of other resources that do impact, you know, salmon and their habitat. So uh, we definitely work at each of those levels trying to reduce impacts um, on a variety of, of levels, uh, but I think you know, our thing with stream restoration in particular in the interior is is we're, we're the home, the natal areas for a large component of the overall Fraser return of, of salmon. Um, some years in the, in the Thompson area in our territory is a big you know, percentage of the returning fish. 
Um, and obviously, obviously it's only one area, there's other areas as well, but you know, we, we like to think that we're, we're the home, where they're, where these, these fish are born, where they, where they live their first parts of their life. So a big thing for us to do with habitat in particular is, is making the best quality habitat for those fish that do make it back and do spawn in our area, in our territory and do live that first component of their life history in our territory as well. We want to create the best home for those fish. I encourage people to really think about go beyond hope, go into the interior and think of what's happening to those small streams. These are the places where these fish are spawning. Those habitats are often easily eroded by abnormally high flows. So I think we have to try to look at that. We have to try to buffer some of the changes due to climate change so that these fish have proper spawning habitats and also a few of the species such as coho and chinook will spend a year in fresh water in these streams so we want to make sure that habitat is healthy for them going forward. I think only if we look at all of the habitat needs of salmon throughout all of the province are we going to find a solution that works for everybody. I am, well, a contractor with BC Conservation Foundation right now. We're uh, a fee-for-service, not-for-profit organization. Um, we take a small admin fee for the work we do, and uh, any surplus funds go into our, our Land for Wildlife Fund, and that is uh, there to uh, purchase land with other organizations for recreation and conservation purposes. And so we have the restoration work on, on the stream beds that Mike Wallace is doing. Uh, Aaron uh, at SFC is doing the monitoring and delivering the Fisher exchanges and Thompson Rivers University is doing the scientific part. And Mike's been looking at these, uh, the reality of climate change for years. The theoretical solution is to look at streams properly. That, that requires some resources for fisheries and oceans to be able to do that. And prioritize streams based on key criteria. What are the fish habitat values there? Uh, is there a potential to restore that habitat with a high likelihood of it becoming productive again? Otherwise you might be wasting money. And pick your priority sites and go after them en masse. I mean large lengths of area. And so we could look at streams uh, like, like the dead man that are really important for salmon and steelhead and decide that maybe they're priority streams and uh, figure out how to uh, get resources freed up to help, say, Skeetchison Band undertake a larger number of projects than they can currently do so that there's more habitat intact. So if you lose one site because it washes out, there's other sites that are built there that the fish will gravitate to. An interesting thing is that when we're building these restoration sites, within a short time of constructing our habitat features, which is really all about roughness, rough edge, to allow water to undercut under structure that will not wash out, but, under, but undercut enough so there's a pool there, and play with the hydraulics a bit so that there's habitat for fish and less, less volatile energy in the stream. That's really what the fish habitat structures try to achieve. It's, it's not uncommon for fish within the system to gravitate immediately to those structures within days or weeks of them being built. We never claim that we've improved fish productivity. That would be crazy. But what is very obvious is that fish that are in the system prefer the habitat we built to where they were, which is a very strong sign to us that we're doing the right thing. Even if we can't measure all the success criteria, we see that when the fish come and rest under a log that's just been placed there, that they probably appreciate what we're doing. At least they make use of the habitat value that we're trying to put in place for them. A healthy natal stream habitat looks like has, you know, the, the components of cool, consistent water. Uh, shade trees along the bank. You know, if it's like in the Lewis Creek area, hopefully we have setback fencing so that cows are only allowed to access the creek in certain spots to get water. We want to make sure that they're water, but we want to make sure that they're protecting the salmon um, and that there's, you know, little to no other garbage or anything else going into that stream or uses 
Um, last year, we were doing the, the drought calls. Lewis Creek and Lemieux Creek um, were getting to a point where we almost had to shut down all irrigation. So thankfully, this you know the farmers on on the streams uh, voluntarily reduce their watering. So if we didn't have that, you know, the streams would be dry. So an understanding, you know, for them to make sure that if they don't have water, the fish don't have water. And if they continue to take the water, nobody's going to have water. It, it, it would be very hard to fill that back up if it's, it's gone. We have to have clean water going through the gravels to supply oxygen to those eggs and larval fish, as well as to take away waste products. So clean gravel is critical. The second critical aspect is that of having a healthy riparian zone. That's the vegetation that lines the edges of our rivers and streams. A healthy riparian zone has trees and bushes in it, and they do a number of things, such as provide leaves that fall into the stream. That litter is called coarse particulate organic matter, or CPOM, and that feeds some of the insects in the stream. They're called shredders, so it's food. The riparian zone also, through all those leaves on the trees, provides shade, and that keeps temperatures from getting too high. Salmon and trout are very sensitive to high temperatures. We want to keep those temperatures low. A healthy riparian zone or tree cover there also will provide large wood when those trees eventually die, fall into the stream because large woody debris in a stream is responsible for creating deep pools, which are good hiding spots for fish, as well they create gravel areas, gravel bars. Both are habitat features that are essential for these juvenile salmon and for the spawning salmon as well. Then finally, having a healthy riparian zone on the edge of the stream will also act as a filtering agent to remove excess nutrients that often come off our agricultural fields, for example. So that will prevent the river from getting too much nuisance algae in it. If you don't want a stream that is green and slimy, that is not a healthy place for fish to live. There's no guarantee, obviously, in the world of fishing, but uh, it's becoming harder and harder to even have those opportunities to, to go fishing for, for all sectors and, and all people, you know, First Nations included. Um, you know, we being at the, the, the end of the line for a salmon returning, we feel that we can pick and choose where to appropriately harvest salmon in certain areas that are, uh, you know, have str stronger returning fish and can handle that sustainable level of harvest. Um, but as you work your way downstream and into the marine area, um, that opportunity to harvest fish without impacting weaker returns um, is becoming an issue, uh, a bigger issue, and it always has been. So I guess, you know, how do you then rebuild these weaker stocks and allow harvesting on uh, more abundant returning fish? It's, it's a huge balancing act and it's complicated uh, and it's tough. It's tough for people. Um, there, there's people uh, feeling left out, obviously, of, of that connection to fishing or their livelihood. Um, but at the same time, there's this need to rebuild those weaker stocks so that we can all get back to, you know, enjoying the resource and, and enjoying the act of fishing um, between all of us and get back to that. The four pillars that uh, form our program are habitat restoration, innovative scientific monitoring, innovative partnership with the uh, fishing industry, and uh, collaboration and mutual learning opportunities. So those are the four outcomes we want to achieve. Those are the four pillars, if you will. Those are the four components of our project. We look at a site, we do an assessment prior to construction. We want to get sort of a baseline of pre-construction pre activities. What was the problem? Uh, and, and take measurements and, and pictures, et cetera, on those sites. And then we'll go back, as soon as a site is constructed, we'll go back and do the same level of assessment, uh, tracking and noting all the changes. We'll go back after that first flood and make sure, again, it's still functioning as prescribed as we are designed it, uh, make sure it's all still there. Sometimes we've you know, recently had very, very large, significant flooding events that have uh, caused extreme amounts of damage so you know longer term again is we want to make sure the sites that we're a part of and uh, uh, building and or partnering with groups we want to make sure that 
they're still you know there they're still functioning uh, we can't have extreme long-term uh, recovery if our short-term measures have failed uh, so we need to keep an eye on these and we feel it's very important to to uh, to do that uh, Paul Creek in particular it's it's very um, it's been altered over many years of uh, say farming activity or industrial activity um, it the channel has been straightened uh, quite a bit uh, streams don't like to flow straight they like to have a meander uh, that reduces, you know, uh, erosion impacts if, if the stream can meander. It takes out a lot of that water velocity. So when we have, you know, very large sections of stream uh, that is channelized straight, uh, it speeds up the water. And whenever that water does finally hit a corner, that corner will be severely impacted. And or uh, road crossings is another huge potential impact that, you know, a lot of these road crossings were done many decades ago. Uh, quite often they were installed with uh, too small a diameter of culverts that are prone to uh, getting blocked with debris and flooding, uh, causing obviously infrastructure damage, but uh, barriers to fish migration. Um, so that's the big component of Paul Creek was looking at uh, those migration challenges. Um, there was, you know, there was quality habitat that was surveyed upstream of these fish barrier sites. Uh, so really our goal, end goal, was to get fish, uh, in, partic in particular coho, using that very quality uh, naturalized or natural looking habitat um, that had some good components to it. So, um, so we you know, did an initial survey of the entire stream uh, section that you know, fish could currently get into uh, and we started prioritizing which sites that we could do first. Um, to get the best results out of, and that was uh, eliminating uh, barriers to passage for them at several road crossings, basically, or an industrial area that um, actually had the entire stream flowing through a culvert, um, you know, a hundred meter long culvert underground um, that deteriorated over time and ended up finally getting plugged. So um, the, the easy goal of those projects was take out the fish barriers uh, provide uh, a design and, and build it a certain way that provided optimal uh, ha habitat for fish getting through um, some certain certain challenging spots. Like some of these culverts weren't replaced. We just added some some structure with rock, mostly meant to provide an easy uh, passage of, of adult returning fish and juvenile fish uh, through these road crossing sites. Uh, and actually had those fish um, the last two years now we had those fish through all the the known fish barriers and actually counted them in uh, the co very very quality habitat that we were trying to get those fish to they actually spawned in the exact locations um, the last two years so uh, huge success story um, you know this is one very small creek that has uh, a fairly small typical population of coho but uh, again, it's about, you know, we don't want to only work on large systems that have the most returning fish. We want to work in some of these smaller systems, uh, provide benefits there that, you know, you keep keep working on those ones. It's a, it's a cumulative thing that you just have more and more returning fish and you give them more opportunities to, for, for good quality habitat. Uh, and if we keep working on a number of those smaller systems as well, then you know, overall, long term, we should see some benefits for sure and, and obvious benefits to, you know, the local people living on that stream and, and local communities such as the Cumlums that, uh, uh, you know, we're, we're all on board and participated fully on each of these projects. You know, now we had fish above these barriers and, and they can be proud that, hey, these fish are, are rebuilding in our, our local stream. And I think you get more and more people on board thinking that like that and have that connection that you know longer term you, you start getting more and more people back to believing that hey these salmon can return they can rebuild we just need to provide the best home possible for them to do so and and let them on their own uh, figure out where to go in that stream and uh, start getting back to uh, to living in that stream So some of the work we're doing right now with this project is working on Lewis Creek and we're looking at assessing 
how effective some of the stream restoration techniques are. It's fairly common to have people go in and do work on a stream, whether it's building riffles or whether it is going to be shoring up the bank sides. But often, the part that's missing is going in afterwards and looking at the efficacy to see if it really is working. So we're pleased to be working with this project. So what we're doing is going in and students are doing research looking at before and after the riffles have been built and looking at the bank sides that have been stabilized by, by the project and those that have not, and then comparing the benthic community there. And these are aquatic insects. These are mayflies, stoneflies, insects like that. And they're the basis of the food chain within these stream ecosystems. And it's really critical when we think about salmon and their life cycles and what they need to survive. A big part of that is their juvenile stage, which is in the freshwater habitat. So these aquatic insects are eaten by these salmon. And so we want to make sure these habitats are fulfilling all the life needs of the fish. So our research is already showing some great results. We're showing that an area that was uh, in poor quality, once the artificial riffle was built, it increased the amount of these invertebrates that fish eat tremendously. And we're also able to compare some of the, the uh, bankside restorations as well. We've found already that the commercial fishing industry is very wise to what is going on in terms of uh, declining fish counts, fish harvestability, and they're very concerned and very much more aware of the various runs and species concerns than we ever knew as we worked in the interior here. So we've already had the opportunity to meet them and find out that they actually share a lot of our concerns and interests. And we're looking for mutual learning opportunities like this, where we have Sequepnik Fisheries Commission and Thompson Rivers University working on monitoring methods. We also want to work with the fishing industry and have them come up and look at what we're doing and understand the monitoring that we're doing and the fish habitat restoration that we're doing that in part supports their industry and try and garner as much support mutually back and forth between our groups. We consider ourselves to be habitat restoration practitioners and we consider them, the fishing industry, to have a, a stake in this by the fact that these natal stream habitats are in fact part of the ecosystem infrastructure that their commercial fishing industry model sustainability depends on. It, they are taking, they are making use of the biological infrastructure in these natal streams that produces the fish that they harvest. And that's great. And they should have an interest in maintaining that natal stream habitat because it, it's what supports the industry in the longer term. And I think we've already seen through uh, meetings we've had with commercial fishers up here that we are very much on the same page and want to provide mutual support and we are looking for opportunities and for example through this video to reach out to commercial fishing industry reps and other interested parties to really promote the idea that we need as much support as we can as practitioners in restoring and maintaining fish habitat value in these natal streams so these fish that return have a place to lay their eggs and they're young to rear so they can actually return to the ocean, otherwise they won't show up. We had an opportunity a couple of years ago to have a Fisher Exchange event and it was extremely successful. We had some fishers come up that represented the industry and they were very astute, very wise people. And they were also willing, very well experienced in their world and they were willing to, to cross that bridge and come over to our, uh, our local area and not only show a keen interest and a lot of support in the theoretical background be behind what our program's all about. But they went to the field and undertook some work exchange activities with us where they actually ran equipment on sites on Paul Creek that were being restored at the time and undertook planting uh, activities with us and went out for tours to the Skechison Van Lands with Aaron Gillespie from the uh, Squipnik Fisheries Commission and went and saw Don Ingus there and were astounded at the amount of fish habitat uh, restoration work that has been done by Skechison Band and other groups over the years and the care and consideration that groups like Skechison exhibit in terms of the restraint they show in managing their own fisheries as they return to the Dead Man River and I think that was one of the things that in fact they, they, they said that that really impressed them. They had no idea there was that much work going on in the interior and that they would love to support it in the future because they see the value in it.